lucky that people yes. use the substance. And uh, I guess in some respects, uh, if it's legalized, there's more scope for research and uh, for a clearer understanding as to the very real dangers. Uh, and in that interview that you mentioned you had looked at, uh, I, I kind of uh, thought about what would be the, the, the warnings that uh, one would sort of have to put forward to the public uh, because it's You don't just see the colds and flus of psychiatry, mm. and uh, you've certainly seen a fair amount of cannabis induced psychosis, which is uh, something that certainly uh, is very often overlooked. Yeah. So, you know, the thing is, when one looks at cannabis being yes. available, it's the same thing like alcohol, it's available. That's the thing. Some people take alcohol, nothing happens. But what we do know that cannabis use has long-standing risk factors for other mental disorders, which includes mood disorders, anxiety disorders, risk for schizophrenia like illnesses, psychotic disorders. Effects it has on the brain. That's the yeah, that's yeah. another thing I was mm. gonna yeah. ask you. And, and that's where the problem is. So the, the active psychoactive ingredient in, uh, if you look at the, uh, the plant itself, cannabis itself, there's about 500 metabolites in, in cannabis. Of that, the, the delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinoid, which is the 9THC, is the active psychoactive ingredient which acts on the receptors within the brain. And that is responsible for actually affecting. says that it, it helps, may help for anxiety and depression. There are certain different strains that may be mm. helpful, like maybe cannabis oil, which is the CBD oil, that they say may be helpful for uh, anxiety right. and depression. And but once yeah. again, studies don't show that that can be effective because there's also long-term studies that side need effects. to be... Well, I think exactly uh, they're they, uh, not commonly used as the, the sort of first-line approach. Exactly, yes. okay. uh, and the truth is that the emphasis which has recently been placed on sort of using cannabis for medicinal purposes, yes. uh, it also needs to be sort of put in its place, that this is not uh, adopted mm. as a first-line approach by anyone specifically. But just to go back to the point We know, you know, uh, people use alcohol, they lose their inhibitions, and um, as time unfolds, uh, you're likely to see uh, an increasingly more and more um, a sort of, uh, uninhibited Disinhibited, event yeah. uh, yeah. playing out. Whereas cannabis um, uh, is, is, is not like that. Uh, it can affect one individual very differently from the next, and that would be largely uh, related to the person's uh, individual history. You know, if they've got a family history uh, of mental disorders, uh, if they themselves have got a history of anxiety or depression, they they're not going. They not good candidates they're more prone for, uh, uh, for for the substance, and are unlikely. If I could use that yes. kind of terminology. Yeah, I mean, like with alcohol, with smoking, and, you know, people know it's bad for you, but it is legal. Mm. Uh, I mean, being an ophthalmologist, you... ...major side effects to all these things, but mm. I suppose it's, it's the user or the person who's doing it that has to understand all of that. And, uh, you know, the moderation... Um, right. I think just with the cannabis, I just wanted to ask about mm. the cannabis oil. There has been an increase of using it in cancer patients. Mm -hmm. I think that was also not uh, documented. Yeah, the, the once again, it goes back to not. research and how much, how yeah. effective uh, is it, and also for the study. So if you look at for cancer patients, it's for pain yes. and to help appet increase appetite to help with the nausea as well. Okay. 
for multiple sclerosis, they may use it for the spasticity, says it causes muscle relaxation. But once again, the type of cannabis oil that they're using, you know, who, yeah, right? who's marketing it, who's mm. using it, the, 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 the content. I had one patient who actually used cannabis oil. He was given cannabis oil that he used to ingest as pills that used right. to come. He developed a manic psychosis. Yeah. When we tested his urine, he tested positive for THC. Yeah. So you you don't so you know the purity know. of the cannabis oil because you, the thing well, is it was marketed as CBD, CBD but, uh, but it, it was it actually a THC. It had a yeah. hint of THC, so okay. that's the problem. Yeah. So you don't know who you're buying it from. That's true. Uh, you don't know. Uh, we have the studies that show that this active uh, this sample that they're using or this CBD oil right. has been used on these patients and have been tested and proved. Hmm. You know, what I'm saying hmm. we need, so the, the so norms and the standards are not there. Exactly. So, and right. we don't know. And are there, is the psychosis and these effects, are they permanent? No, but it can be with chronic use. Okay. So what we often see is, we, so when one looks at psychiatric conditions and when the use of, of comorbid substance use, one often gets, you almost like, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Yeah. You look at, is it the substances that causes, or is it the substances that unleash a pre-existing psychotic okay, uh, underlying. underlying psychiatric condition was there that was there based on genetics and one of uh, environmental factors so that's where the problem lies so often we find patients who have a psychotic episode or um, manic like episode because they've used a certain substance it takes them uh, maybe two three weeks to settle down and they find and then we put them on medication they get labeled as maybe schizophrenia bipolar but the question is, was that drug induced or was it an underlying pure psychiatric condition? So we often give them, when that happens, it's all muddy. Yes. And the first thing that, uh, is we say it's, it's a drug induced psychosis yeah. and we wait and see. In the event the patient doesn't use any substances and they have a second episode, then we say, okay, okay let's, yeah. yeah, then we can say, we can say this is a pure psychiatric condition. But most often hmm. we find that the patients often have dual diagnosis. Well, it's not, uh, I mean, the, the that there's a one percentage a one yes. percent of the population is likely to be schizophrenic mm. that's true uh, but uh, when uh, when you kind of uh, t uh, put substances into the mix uh, the percentage population wise escalates and so one has to always be very cautious in identifying what is substance induced and uh, the truth is that uh, you know as I often say to patients uh, if we can identify the substance as the cause of the chaos and this unmanageability exactly. that's going on in your life, we have a clear way forward. It's far more concerning, and obviously the prognosis is is a is a whole lot poorer when we're talking about moving towards independence. AB Dowji 082-352-3526. Would you like to give Sadaka 365 days a year? You can with the Al Imdad Foundation's daily Sadaka program. Donate as little as one rand a day for a month for each member of your family, up to any specified amount, and receive monthly feedback on where your contributions have made a difference. Visit alimdad.com and download your daily Sadaka debit order form or call 0861-786-243 for more information.
Osman's Taj Mahal Spice and Rice. For over 80 years, Osman's Taj Mahal have been perfecting the art of the perfect blend of spices, pure, aromatic, and well seasoned. Spices to tantalize your taste buds. From creative cuisines to gastronomical gourmet goodies, from exotic odors to traditional dishes. Rose and Ilachi syrup, our quick and easy Briani pack, and our traditional range of spice blends. Osman's Taj Mahal, there is no substitute for quality. Looking for sheep, goats, or cattle? Look no further than Club River Livestock in Johannesburg. Be it a function or the noble ibadah of sadaka, akika, or kurbani, we have the right animal to suit your needs. We slaughter, skin, store, slice back, and label. Delivery or distribution to the needy can be done on your behalf. For a quality guaranteed livestock service and an experience like never before, call Mohammed on 083-378-71. Global Voice for Humanity. Assalamu alaikum and good evening to all our listeners. You are back with Body Talk and me, Dr. Rabia Motigur. In studio with us, we have psychiatrist Dr. Viresh. I think I'd like to move on. You know, there are so many different drugs that substances that people become addicted to and some of them are prescription and some of them are not prescription. Any one of my greatest fears is, you know, my kids being becoming addicted to any sort of substance. Um, it happens in every home, you know, religious or rich, poor. And I think, uh, you know, some people have fallen into the safety that no, can't happen to us because of certain such and such a reason. I just want, you know, a little advice or from both of you. Um, families mm. out there who are living with a loved one or that is, you know, addicted to substances, what is the process for them? And what are the first signs? I think I read something on your uh, website, Dan, mm. about the first signs, um, you know, and how to go about it. And then, Viresh, you can tell us also from the medical standpoint, mm. what is needed for these patients and mm. their families? Mm. Look, uh, uh, you know, I suppose when you uh, ask what are the signs, uh, if one talks a bit broadly, uh, perhaps what I could stress is what develops is a relationship with the substance. So, I mean, the signs, the kind of dilated pupils yeah. and the irregular sleep patterns and your child sort of start feeling, uh, you know, starting to feel like a bit of a stranger where there's no longer and he's busy and on his way out every few minutes. That's one thing. And so a parent could sort of uh, know very clearly uh, that there's something up. But wh when is there actually a problem? And that's when one talks about a pathological relationship that develops with the substance and the person's whole whole life uh, starts to revolve around the getting and the using of the substance. And so in essence, uh, the individual starts to betray uh, the family and uh, the, the values that they were brought up with. And that often is what sort of brings things uh, to the fore in the family environment, is that um, what may have traditionally been acceptable is now sort of uh, being dismissed as uh, unimportant. And so there's a high level of conflict in the home environment that starts to escalate. And the challenge is, uh, well, what do you do then? Do you just sort of dismiss this as a adolescent uh, moving uh, uh, into sort of their teenage years? Or, uh, or do you actually confront the elephant that's uh, in the dining room, yeah. you know? And that's where the struggle lies. A lot of families are conflict avoidant. That's the thing. You hear so many mm. that let's distract them, or if this happens, you know, if you'll, or sometimes sending them away to a school or to a university, things that fixes the problem. You you often hear things, right, of that nature. 
you know, uh, that absolutely the avoidance. Yeah, and the, the the, they're not the wanting to, know. to see the reality. That's you know, it. we we are a successful family. Yes. We uh, we've always sort of presented a certain image uh, to the world. These are this is how the other children have functioned, and uh, so this just can't be happening. Yes. And so what could in fact uh, be a scenario of early intervention is unfortunately sort of uh, sent away to later present as a, as a more sort of entrenched scenario. Yeah, I think when one looks at substance use, you know, you, you get the physiological stuff happening yes. in the body. It's the use of the substance, the ingestion, and as Dan said, what does, the, what does it do to the individual? Yes. So if you're an alcoholic, we know the signs. You'll see liver cirrhosis. You'll see the jaundice. You'll see all these things on the body. And, and that's a, a giveaway. But that's late onset. Very late, and, yeah. And that's often when the patient... ...that changes. Their, their sleep patterns change. Their appetite changes. Then there's also the demand for money or wanting money. Yes. And then you find that there's the stealing that happens at home. Small things go missing in the house and you can't put a finger as to where is it gone. Then you look at the child, what psychologically what happens to the child. The child may become withdrawn. The child is always out. And then the sleep patterns change. I often get parents tell me, you know, the sleep, child sleeps through the whole day, is up all night, you know, and then yeah. and his bloodshot eyes. So, so those are the early warning signs. You say, Something's going on with this boy. Mm. Something needs to be done. Often people are scared of the stigma. That's so they it. don't talk about yeah. it. Talking about why, uh, uh, there there's some fundamental issues uh, that uh, one can reflect on. But uh, as life unfolds, the, the, the issues change and uh, the availability uh, of substances and, and what, you know. A different scenario may present to a 35-year-old who's uh, an investment banker and sort of exposed to a whole new set of circumstances. So, yeah, this is a, a very sort of colorful landscape, I suppose. And that's uh, obviously, you know, just one dimension. Then, then uh, we, we you touched on prescription addicts uh, yeah. who, who have a different older. profile. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the new thing is Ritalin mm. for university students and people that work mm. in high-pressured environments. You know, the that need for right. stimulants. And the need for stimulants, which mm. is, you know. Um, also, I think if you look at addiction as a disease, instead mm. of the stigma that it carries with it, like diabetes, like if you do not treat it, you will succumb to the consequences. Mm. I mean, is that something that you, you would say? You would... You would look at it as it is something that's what lifelong. We, what we commonly do in a, what I commonly do in an assessment, you know, because there's often a pushback from the patient saying to whoever they've come there with, you know, how can he say I'm a, a, an addict? You know, he's only known me for five minutes. Mm. And I think what's uh, quite clear is that um, this is a... a the term uh, addiction is not really, the term no. addict is not a clinical term. Yes. But when we start talking about substance dependency uh, and substance use disorders, these are clearly defined conditions with specific criteria. And uh, so you could say to a person that, uh, you know, the, this is not some kind of we need to uh, identify that you are substance dependent and uh, these are the criteria you meet and that uh, a support and in fact ideally asking for the support in a direct and a respectful way instead of sort of falling apart at the seams and then having the whole kind of family rushing in to pick up the pieces because that's not a helpful way 
of accessing the support that's available. And how often do you get these patients voluntarily coming in or do you have to, is there another option? I mean, what... student studying mm -hmm. in Turkey and who does not think it's harmful so she would like to know from you what and then what other side effects so if you have to stop smoking cannabis often there's you get a brief period of what we call a cannabis withdrawal medication we'll be able to ad identify probably the underlying uh, psychiatric condition if there is something so it's same thing with patients who use alcohol they often use alcohol if they go to parties and uh, if they go out uh, for functions and when they stop taking the alcohol they realize they get more anxious and then we start to realize okay there's probably an underlying anxiety disorder but in your if for you in the long what you're saying is uh using the cannabis and now stopping i don't think there should be any long-term side effects with the cessation of cannabis use okay okay yeah. yeah i can go to south africa and, and <laughs> remember that. the other thing is some people take cannabis nothing happens to them same thing as some people taking alcohol however some people that take cannabis for long standing can run the risk of developing certain psychiatric conditions and that's where the problem lies and that's why as psychiatrists we often say don't take these substances because they are psychoactive drugs they do affect the brain they uh, remember one thing which we didn't mention right in the very start is the uh, cannabis is the gateway to other drugs.
we know that from uh, from our teachings from that people often start of taking cannabis and it goes on to other things often the in south africa we often find that the cannabis is laced with other uh, drugs especially opioid derivatives yeah. because the once what happens with that is patients then become addicted to it they become dependent on it and can't come off it because they run the risk okay. of withdrawals so that's the that's the worry oh all right I just did that. So thank you so much. Right, Kakiso. Thanks, Kakiso, for calling thank in. Thank you. Um, I think we'll just take a quick ad break before we continue. Listen to something fresh. Listen to Salam Media. Affordable December Umrah with one-stop travel from 11,499 rand per person departs 25th of December and returns on the 5th of January. Package includes return airfares from Johannesburg, five nights Medina, five nights Mecca, Umrah visa non-repeat. Upgrade options are available on request. Call us for further info on our other packages. Now open at 39 Belgravia Road, Athlone. Al Shazia celebrates its 20th <laughs> and um, um, you can see I love his books. Yeah. <laughs> and um, Dr. V. Or take, you know, uh, the famous actor Robert. Looking in the ad break about the. How you know, people often say, do they have, you know, they'll have to change their whole circle of friends, they'll have to change their 
way of socializing because a lot of it comes from peer pressure or, you know, like-minded people doing the same things. Mm. So how do you, you know, counteract all these things or how do you go about it? I mean, in terms of your um, rehabilitating You see, um, the, the process... not using drugs. This is fundamentally about finding a way of being which is meaningful and fulfilling and allows the person to actualize their potential. Because in reality, uh, we all have to face our challenges and we have to be pre prepared to reality on its own terms and as life unfolds there's no shortage uh, of challenges that people have to deal with so it's not surprising you know if a person has uh, not necessarily not everyone who is uh, abstinent is actually in recovery recovery is uh, a way of being uh, which involves Okay. And uh, nice so it doesn't surprise me when I hear stories of people uh, who go back to using yes. uh, because they've perhaps just reached a point in time where they feel deprived and if they haven't done the kind of uh, introspection and haven't developed insight and made the sacrifices that are required, uh, the transition back into using is uh, seamless. Okay. <laughs> you know, yes. it happens mm. instantaneously. The friends are there and the kind of old way of being is uh, fits like an a old pair of shoes. It's not, uh, not a difficult process and they not necessarily, uh, it's not like they've uh, invested in relationships uh, that now are being betrayed. That's, that's not necessarily the case if you haven't reestablished yourself in a, in a more constructive way. Um, That a little himself with 20 vials of methadone yeah and needed to be on mm. methadone sure for, for like a long time long, for a long time can you have this reverse addiction to that or can you are there some patients that you can't get off the methadone like or whatever so, or the so, so there's, uh, there's, there's a lot of studies that show that uh i mean there's two groups of people uh, of way of thinking for opioid addiction for example there's some who believe on maintenance Got such a intense hair through everything else. Um, this is all in a contained environment. Be okay. providing you something that so that your addiction is not there all the time. Okay. Okay. So same uh, and so that in that way you kind of keep this ongoing. And there are some who believe that no, we taper this off and then you enter a program and then you try to do it on your own, but. There are some patients who are on methadone or who are on buprenorphine and take it all the time to try and help them with their opioid addiction. Yeah. And they're suc successful with that. Yeah. The, mm. the philosophy in South Africa is more sort of orientated towards uh, abstinence. Yeah. Mm. Although, you know, the, the sort of uh, movement towards replacement, uh, the, the maintenance, kind of maintenance yes. therapy as opposed to replacement yes. therapy, yeah. short-term replacement therapy, uh, it has started uh, sort of becoming more common. But w what I thought, Varish, may be helpful to comment on is the untimely deaths 
mm. are sometimes related to the person who hasn't used for a while. They've been abstinent. And then they, uh, you know, have kind of become intolerant of the substance, use a similar amount to what they were using previously, and that's when you have the... Just yeah. comment on that. So, so, so that's the thing is, remember, once you get tolerance, if you go into a recovery, then the amount you were taking before becomes... Too much. too much but okay. your presumption is that i need so much to get the same because effect you had, you, and that can you on. exactly and especially i think opioids is the, one of the biggest ones yeah because that leads to death mm. in, especially in overdose and that's mm. that's our biggest uh complications we're finding nowadays that patients sudden deaths with opioid yeah uh, I and mean, you hear about it in the media overdose, from, yeah. you mm. know the prominent people always you know the actors mm. or Right. I mean, how many of them have this country, other countries, have overdosed on these on some sort of substance? Mm. Mm. Um, so, you know, you had mentioned Dan that you can be 15, you can be 20, you can be 50. So there's no, so somebody who's never used as a child, you know, can start at the age of 40 or the age of 50. Mm. I mean, it's mm. it's not a certain type of personality or. Well, there's a, there there. <coughs> Certain profiles yes. uh, that one finds uh, that present. So, uh, for instance, uh, you know, when we're talking about the young person who's struggling to make the transition from adolescence into adult yes. life and starts using cannabis or some other substances and their kind of developmental process gets derailed, uh, that, that's the, the one profile. more successful person who's now got access to cash and uh, okay. socializing on a whole different level and cocaine uh, becomes uh, accessible. A and then you have the sort of unfulfilled housewife whose husband is career orientated and unavailable and, uh, uh, you know, starts present, may have, may have some sort of physical injury and use some kind of analgesic and yes. before she knows it she's a codeine addict which mm. uh, is hard to stomach when uh, she's kind of when it's explained to her that she is no different from uh, the the pethidine addict yes. yeah. or the or the heroin the addict heroin. and uh, it's uh, those are very difficult addictions to deal with because uh, those patients are medication seeking and very resistant to sort of acknowledging the real unmanageability that uh, exists in their lives because it's it's often so shameful and secretive. Uh, that's just another profile, you know. Then you have uh, the the kind of older uh, folk who uh, kind of move into retirement and instead of having two whiskeys after work every day, uh, they have two whiskeys after lunch, and <laughs> and, yeah. and that's when it starts. Yeah. So uh, you know, it's it's uh, there there there's some typical profiles that uh, one sees, uh, some more interesting than others. Yeah, just to talk about the different drugs. So you know, we always. the fear of teaching your children not to take any sweet wrapper or mm -hmm. you know in term you know these are the things that go around so in terms of the different types of drugs and the fear that you know people have with, with just one taste you're addicted for life can maybe be just yeah, expand I, I on those I think it depends on on the page, on the individual's first experience with the drug okay so if you're taking something like a stimulant or an amphetamine you have that intense euphoria sense of well-being, racing heart, feeling on top of the world, you can dance all night, mm. you know, and um, it almost uplifts you. And when, once you have that kind of feeling, the aim is, I need to get that feeling again. Okay. So, and then you get the others, like, uh, like so if you look at alcohol, maybe weed, uh, benzodiazepine, yes. um, even opiates to a certain degree, those are almost like the downers, the where downers. you feel more calm, more laid back, more placid. And then those that want uh, stimulants, which is the cocaine, um, cat, uh, amphetamines, and, uh, and amphetamine-like substances, 
those are the ones that are stimulating. So that first experience, what you get, is what you want. And what we didn't mention earlier, and I think it's important for us to realize, is that substance abuse is a biological problem. There is something that's going on in the brain. Yes. We have a reward center in the brain. What I felt the first time, I want more. Okay. The brain subconsciously would start looking for it. If you ask some of the addicts, they have to just hear a story of the use of a substance or a feeling of the. Will not the body will not rest until it finds. Once it finds it, it uses, it suppresses that reward center. Until and, it starts. And then there's the guilt and the. Remorse. No, I shouldn't have drove down that road to go find that person, and I did. Mm. 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 Because the reward center is so strong. I mean, they've done studies on rats, and they've given rats cocaine. Yeah. And what they found is that the rats that they get... It shows that the rats that were addicted to cocaine went for the cocaine and not the food. Yeah. So there is it's something true. in the brain that's mm. changed, it that makes them change. want you to go seek. Mm. And that's what causes the seeking behavior within humans as well. And mm. I, I suppose uh, what, uh, what you're touching on, Varish, is, you know, our, our brains are, are, are highly sensitive uh, instruments. We, we yes. can't even begin to appreciate the complexity. And, uh, you know, we come in this sort of clumsy way, putting these chemicals uh, flooding the brain and the neurotransmitters with all sorts of chemicals and uh, you know being quite surprised when there are dramatic effects mm -hmm. and so you know that's what I often say to people is that you, you know you are causing damage to your brain this you know brain damage is sometimes uh, naively conceived as some eventuality after years and years of, and then you yes. sort of present with slurred speech, and, and it's far more subtle than that. Uh, and the living consciously uh, that uh, is required to, to reprogram yourself and to adopt uh, some kind of cognitive strategy against falling repeatedly into the same trap uh, is, is not an easy process. And I think that that is perhaps something very important to touch on, is that the treatment process is not a 20-day program and it's not a 30-day yeah. program. It's an ongoing commitment. We've sort of conceptualized a meaningful treatment program as needing to sort of uh, reduce in intensity, but over a year period. Because, you know, we're talking about people who have been using substances for five years, 10 years, 25 years uh, to, to sort of cognitively reprogram the brain uh, and to get the support structures in place is an enormous undertaking. And that is why treatment fails, because people underestimate the, the effort required to, to get well and to, to, to kind of uh, reposition themselves. And it goes back to what you said, it's about psychoeducation. Psychoeducation to the family, yes. which is very important and is often where it has to be targeted as well. So family also starts understanding what this disease is all about. Yes. It is a disease. It's a neurobiological process that's occurring in the brain, which families don't understand at times because you often will get a family, but can't she just stop? She knows what she's doing to herself. Yes, yeah. You know, that's the first thing you hear. And, and adults then, make their own choices. Exactly. And, you know, this is, yeah. they, she doesn't get it. Why can't she see it? But the mm. thing is, if this individual could do it, of them, and that's the hard part. Mm. That's why with abstinence, eventually um, you get to a point. Better, it falls into place. It yeah. falls into place. And hence, it's very important for families to understand 
what this is all about. And I think that's where it often... So when one looks at substance abuse, it's a biopsychosocial problem. Yes. Yeah. It's a problem that is affecting the whole community. Well, yeah, that's, I mean, another thing that I... That we haven't even... Yeah. When they're reading that we haven't even touched, it affects not only the person that's abusing, but it affects every single person around them. It affects yes. their work, it affects their, their loved ones, it affects their friends, everything. Well, um, the, the reality is that, uh, you know, the, the phenomena of codependency exists where, you know, we've defunct. Yes. And when the addict is out on a binge, in I'm talking in active addiction, the whole family is in chaos. And yes. uh, it's frightening to start understanding what certain family members are prepared to do uh, to appease the addict. You know, you have mothers mm -hmm. going out into Hillbrow to get heroin because, uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, because they can't cope with the tantrum. I mean, I'm talking obviously in, a, in an extreme, extreme case. situation, no, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, everything starts somewhere. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think I once saw something on... Uh, one of these programs that dealt with drug, drug addiction and a mother said she wishes actually that her child was better off dead than alive because it had driven them to such a point where they were completely, completely helpless. Mm. And, mm. you know, in and out of recovery and it just, you know, you fall back into, I think, a worse situation. But I think relapse. that's where uh, family members need to start appreciating that there are appropriate responses to these kind of scenarios and you know what may be natural maternal instincts in terms of uh, being available for your child and looking after your child may not be helpful mm -hmm. when uh, when uh, this sort of scenario is playing out because uh, it becomes abusive an unconditional relationship uh, where you saying to this person who isn't well, I'm there for you no matter what, yes. is often not a very helpful message. And the, the, the patient or, or the, the addict uh, sort of plays on that and they don't appreciate uh, where they stop and their mother begins. Their mother and their father and their family is just an extension of their own demands. And uh, so for them to start appreciating the impact they're having on, uh, on uh, the family, very clear conditions need to be put in place. Is there, I mean, can, you, can members forcefully take the, mm -hmm. you know, the substance abuser and get them admitted? Yeah. I mean, so what I, is the legal, the law uh, regarding all this? Because that's mm -hmm. also a technicality if mm -hmm. the person is an adult or if the person's a child, like what... You know, mm -hmm. what can they do? So ideally, uh, re recovery works better if the patient voluntarily goes, motivates yes. themselves to go. And But if that's not the case and the patient you feel is a risk to himself or he's destroying everybody around him, then the family can get their family member uh, okay. where they can apply to the courts uh, via the assistance of a social worker and a multidisciplinary team that's working to actually get the person to be committed to rehab involuntarily. But it's called a Section 22. Yeah. And uh, that I've had patients that have been committed to rehab before. Uh, involuntarily, six to eight months, sometimes yes. even longer. And parents do this out of desperation because it's yes. taken so much out of them. They've mm. destroyed their lives. They've mm. picked these people up from wherever, wherever mm. all the time. And they are tired. Mm. They use their last penny. Their yeah, pension no, money. I mean, are, are heartbroken, yes, you know, exactly. and uh, if you think you of come what to a that. natural sort of process it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's the difference, Varish, in, in the sort of uh, certification process that a psychiatrist uh, gets involved in and the committal process? So the com committal process, so the psychiatric uh, uh, ad admission, involuntary admission is a patient who presents with a psychiatric condition. So presents with psychosis or... Where he poses a danger to himself or to others okay. based on a psychiatric ground. So it can be. Psychiatric problem, there's a mental health problem, and the patient needs involuntary care okay. based on that. So there, the psychiatrist makes the decision to give the patient as an involuntary on the ground that he needs psychiatric treatment. Okay. As opposed to substance abuse, 
where a patient has a substance abuse problem. He doesn't want to go for help. The yes. family feels he needs help. The family feels he's ruined himself. He's ruined everybody. He, he's destroyed everything, but he insists he doesn't want help. The family feel if he continues, he's going to be a danger to himself or to others. They then have to prove this to the court. Okay, to say without base, the help of the doctor. Or, without yeah, the help of the doctor, without whatever. the help of the patient himself. Yes. So the family goes to court. They say, we feel this man needs mm. uh, involuntary rehab. We've, on the basis of once he uh, robbed the bank and for whatever. There, there is a social worker who puts a report yeah. together. She puts a report okay. together, yeah. helps the family. He will then get committed to rehab. If he fails to go to, uh, to the rehab or he runs away from rehab, to a year, he will then get sent to jail. And okay. I've had a patient who actually went to jail for that. Yeah. You know, hmm. well, and you you got to so see what can, the you got to see what the jail looks like yeah. to mm. appreciate what the person's actually done. done yeah. 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 But, uh, but in reality, the committal process. Uh, is a legal mechanism that's yes. available to families, yeah. okay. and it's not a criminal procedure. Okay, yeah. That's what I wanted to yes. ask, because they were scared of having a criminal right. charge yeah. against... So, so it's not a criminal okay. procedure. It's actually just an empowering legal mechanism that's available to families in order to get out of what can... Uh, to, to take back their power. Yes. And often when this is on the table and uh, the loved one kind of starts to appreciate the lengths to which the family are now prepared to go, it doesn't necessarily always go all the way. Uh, but uh, what's interesting is sometimes when the person comes prior to committal into treatment, while they're in treatment, we encourage the patient to now say, ask your family to commit you. Go through with the committal order because let them now take you seriously. Let them, you know, yeah. often people in treatment are mm. very frustrated because they've spent years of making sort of empty promises and now the family isn't taking them seriously. So you say you want them to take you seriously. Uh, let them experience you differently. Why don't you sort of encourage them to empower themselves? And it's quite interesting. Therapeutically. Mm. I think we could go on for another hour. Yeah. It's already yeah. after nine. But before we end off, I just want to say telephone numbers for patients that can call. I don't know, Dan, if you could give maybe Houghton House yes. your practice uh, numbers. Mm -hmm. So the number there uh, is 011-787-9142. Okay. And certainly people can... Uh, is there a helpline? Uh, yeah, yeah. There's on our website. There's a 24-hour uh, emergency line. Uh, uh, sorry to Ashley, who's manning it <laughs> at the moment. Uh, but yeah, that that okay. is available. And Viresh, you you have rooms at uh, Akiso and Rand Clinic. Rand Clinic. So Rand okay. Clinic is more for involuntary. Okay. So often what we do there is patients who need involuntary admission. Right. Or where we need to start the in, uh, involuntary committal. Okay. Because sometimes they come in a very psychotic state. That's yes. when we then start implementing the Mental Health Care Act. Okay. By that time, the social worker assists in getting a court date so that the patient may then go on to involuntary rehab. Uh, because most of the time, they resist everything. Yes. Yeah. And they at Rand Clinic, the number is 011-644-2853. And uh, Akiso is 011-590-9500. I want to thank both of you for coming in this evening. I think mm -hmm. really we could have definitely gone on for longer. Um, it's such an important topic and such awareness needs to be brought to it because of, I think, a lot of the stigma and the denial around um, what is happening. But just to let also our listeners know that there is help out there and there are success stories. Mm -hmm. um, and it's multidisciplinary with a whole lot of people involved trying to achieve the same thing. And that's the wellness of the patient. Thank you for listening to us. We'll be back next week. With